Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for July 11th, 2022. It's the time of week when we all get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff, and Adafruit sponsors me to work on CircuitPython, which is a version of the Python programming language designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. And if you live outside the U.S., check out uh, the link at the bottom of the page on every page on the store for uh, international resellers. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython Dev Text channel and the CircuitPython Voice channel. It typically, as today, happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar that you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about the upcoming meetings via Discord. To receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonista's Discord role. There is a notes doc to accompany the recording and meeting. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use it to skip to the parts that interest you the most. As the meeting can run up to 90 minutes, we think it's really handy to have the option to skip around. After each meeting, we'll post the link for the next week's meeting notes in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. And if you wish to participate but can't attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. The meeting is held in five parts. After this intro, the first part is community news, where we take a preview of the Python on Controllers newsletter and uh, see what people around the web are doing with CircuitPython and Python on hardware. Next is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, which is a statistical overview of the whole project. A chance to look at some numbers uh, that summarize what's going on separate from what we're all individually doing. Then, the first of two participatory sections is hug reports an opportunity for you to highlight the good things that folks are doing and to take the time to recognize awesome folks all around our community. The fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we have been up to. You can take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. Then the last part, when necessary, is called in the weeds. If there's a need for a more long-term discussion, this is where uh, we want to do it. It can either come out of status updates or be something that you've identified ahead of time as uh, being too long or um, you know, anything where you want to get back and forth and talk about opinions. Um, that's uh, where that goes. And that covers the structure of the meeting. And so with that, I am going to head over and start community news. So first up, and we're all really excited, announcing CircuitPython Day 2022 on August 19th. Um, is this correct? This says Tuesday, August 19th. I thought it was a Friday. Anyway, we'll double check that. Uh, August 19th is CircuitPython Day 2022, and we've decided that that is the snakiest day of the year. The day highlights all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware. Do you work with CircuitPython? Tag your projects, hashtag CircuitPythonDay2022 on social media, and Adafruit will look to highlight them. And special events will be held during the day. Keep an eye on Adafruit's social media channel for announcements. And there is a link to the Adafruit blog. And uh, we're really, uh, as usual, soliciting uh, the whole public to come and work with us on this. Um, so there's an email address to hit up with your ideas. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch about that and looking forward to the day of. Uh, next up, I like this link to Inclusive Design, uh, a Microsoft methodology born out of digital environments that enables and draws on the full range of human diversity. Most importantly, this means including and learning from people with a range of perspectives. And there's a link to Microsoft and also a PDF document version. Um, it's probably not the last word, but you know, it's great to see thought going in this direction and everyone working better to make things more inclusive. So um, next up after that, uh, project of the week, the Born Hack 2022 Game on Badge. The Born Hack Game on Badge puts the focus on games. With the shape of a small controller and a color LCD screen in the middle, it's ready for a bunch of interesting homebrew games. There's a whole spec list 
Uh, but basically, it uh, is going to be able to run CircuitPython, MicroPython, and all those great things that you know about. And check out the newsletter if you want to know more. Then another badge called the Title Badge. It's got a funky little shape, and it is your electronic companion at EMF 2022. Next up, a fun project with MicroPython using April tags and OpenMV to open a front gate, and that one is via Hackaday. So this is just a few items out of the upcoming newsletter. The CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including Python, CircuitPython, and MicroPython developments. We want you to contribute your bleh. we want you to contribute your own news or project, so please edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with the change. There's a link in the um, notes doc. You may also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And of course, thank you very much to our very own Anne, who spearheads this newsletter every week, and it's just wonderful. Um, so anyway, that wraps up community news, and we are moving on to the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. So every week we get an overview of activity on GitHub over the last seven days and uh, divide it up into a couple of categories. And so overall, in terms of activity, we had 28 pull requests merged by 15 authors. And a name that I don't recognize is Liz Apple. Um, and Ketney's helpfully highlighting a few for me. Carl F. Car excuse me, Carl F. L. Theta Zero and Tom24 are also newer or less frequent contributors, but we want to thank all 15 of those authors. Uh, then we come to reviewers. Reviewers take a look at pull requests in an official capacity and uh, say this looks great or this looks great but we'd like a few changes. And anyway, this week we had eight of them and they are a lot of the usual people, so thank you very much to those reviewers and also people who are operating outside of the official reviewer capacity by just commenting on pull request with, I looked at this, it looks good, I tried it, it fixes the problem. Uh, this helps us enormously in taking all the best changes and improving CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. And with that uh, done, I will also tell you about the core. The core is the most central part of CircuitPython, implemented in the C language, and uh, within that we had nine pull requests merged by eight authors. So Liz Apple is on that list again, so thanks for your contribution. And we had just two reviewers, Dan and Scott, and that is a big wake-up call to me that I need to be reviewing pull requests, of which we have 17 open pull requests. About half of them are under a week, and some of them are open nearly 300 days. And so as usual, we need to kind of look at it from both ends and just keep on top of things a little better than uh, we do. In terms of issues, uh, we had nine closed issues by four people and 13 open by 10 people within the core. So we did have a small increase in the number of open issues, leaving us with 538 open issues. And one thing that we did uh, last week uh, among Scott and Dan and Katni and I was review the bug list according to milestones. We use milestones to uh, show Adafruit's priority in dealing with open issues. And uh, so for 7.3x, we have three uh, issues, probably what we hope are minor bug fixes, that we'd like to make before releasing another uh, stable 7, CircuitPython 7 version. And then for version 8, we have 41 open issues that we'd like to address before we release that as a stable version. And uh, besides that, we have 469 issues labeled long-term, which means that Adafruit isn't prioritizing them right now, although we always love community support uh, to work on those issues. So if you're looking at an issue that you're interested in, pay no attention to the fact that it's long-term. Let us know you want to work on it and get started and help, it, help us improve CircuitPython. Um, so yeah, as far as what's going on narratively, we are really working on version 8. Scott has made some huge strides with the web workflow, which was recently merged, and we would love it if you would kick the tires of that. 
and uh, Dan has been working on the port to the ESP32 original version, which he's temporarily handed off to me. And so really our focus is on these, both finishing up these larger features that we would like in ADO and also tidying up a lot of smaller, um, smaller things. But uh, that is where our thoughts and work are going. And with that, uh, Katni, I hope you can talk to us about the libraries. That I can. So this section is uh, about all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras, such as the community bundle and our cookie cutter. Across all of those repositories, there were 19 pull requests merged by a few of the new names, uh, including um, by a few of the new names that uh, Jeff called out earlier, and a few folks that have been around for a while, thanks to all of our seven authors and uh, seven reviewers. The oldest one was 11 days old, which is great. There were a number of them about a week old, uh, and it looks like we're definitely keeping up with our newer ones as well, so that's really good to see. And that leaves us with 22 open pull requests, which is getting it a little bit down from last week, so that's good to see as well. We had 10 closed issues by five people and eight open by seven people, leaving 649 open issues. 175 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're looking to contribute to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, um, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. If you're interested in reviewing, you can check out the open pull requests. Uh, if you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, um, you know, you can uh, check the code for spelling syntax, that sort of thing, um, and leave a note and let us know that you did. That's always helpful. And once you're comfortable with that, we can talk about leveling you up to the review team. If you are looking to contribute code or documentation, check out the open issues. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. We also have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, as well as we're always available on Discord to help you out there as well. We want you to be able to contribute in a way that works for you. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, there were no new libraries, I don't think, um, and a list of uh, updated libraries that are in the notes, um, but I will not read them off. And uh, that's where we are at the libraries. Thank you, Katni. And last up in this section is Blinka. So Melissa, if you are around, can you give us the details? I am. Um, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had zero pull requests merged. There are currently four open pull requests amongst the repositories. And there were zero closed issues and one open by one person. And we that leaves us with 77 open issues. There were 7,896 PyWheels demos within the last month. And we are at, at 89 boards that we support. And that's it. Thank you, Melissa. And now it is time for the first round robin section called Hug Reports. Uh, as I was saying earlier, Hug Reports uh, is kind of an antidote, antidote to bug reports, and we want you to use this time to thank people around the community who helped you out or who you saw helping out a third party, and anyway, just generally recognizing and building up the people around us. So I will start, and then we'll go in the order of the text of the notes document. Um, so anyway, I wanted to thank Dan, Scott, and Katni for meeting last week to go through the 80 issues list. And as well, uh, Dan and Scott for meeting to talk about the ESP32 branch and brainstorm about the um, issues that we're facing there. And uh, Katni for helping keep the Discord server, uh, this, uh, this doesn't quite make sense, the, the Discord server moderation up to date with the latest technology, that's what I meant. And finally, a group hug. It's so nice to host the meeting again after my break. Even though I'm rusty, it helps me um, feel like I'm back in the swing of things again. And yeah, so next up, I have a note from C. Grover, who is listening in today, or text only, who has a hug for Blitz City DIY for a very useful Pi Portal light sensor gesture detection scheme. Although my final method is different, it was inspiring to see Liz's creative approach and thorough logic. Next, Ask Patrick W. writes, Thank you to Naradoc, Kyle Moore, Evil Dave 66 Purples, Mager Melissa, and Tanu for all their help and patience as I worked on the Wemos Lowland C3 board definition since April. 
An extra special thanks to Todd Bot for adding Wi-Fi.radio.tx power so the Wemo C3 can connect to Wi-Fi. Next, uh, we have Charles Berniford, who has a group hug for everyone. And Dan, who is not at the meeting today, has a hug for me and for Tanut for the ESP32 port meeting, and another for Tanut for an earlier discussion on Espressive SDK config settings. A hug for me, Scott, and Katni for the 800 bug triage meeting. And finally, a hug to Lady Ada for suggestions about ESP32 problems over the past several weeks. And I hope somebody else is going to talk after a while, because I also have notes from David, who is in the, meet, the meeting, who has a hug for Naradoc, Tanut, Retired Wizard, Dan H., and Evil Dave 666 jp and whoever else helped me to start playing with the web workflow, or is also trying to be out there on the edge. And, uh, all right, I think this is the last one that I get to read out. Foamy Guy has a hug for Naradoc for being on Show & Tell to show a web-based library management tool. That was a really cool show. Um, so yeah, check that little segment out if you didn't see it last Wednesday. A, a hug to DJ Devon 3 for the new bitmap saver example, as well as getting more involved in the community and helping folks on Discord. And a group hug. And now, Katni, it's your turn. I don't know. My list is pretty long. Maybe I should make you read it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so first up, a hug to uh, Scott, Dan, and Jeff for meeting to further triage the 8.0 milestone. Um, to Brent, Phil, and Lamore for being super understanding during a situation on Friday. Uh, to Brent and Lauren for Whippersnapper. I haven't had a chance to, or a reason rather, to mess with it until last week to help Brent out, and what little I've seen of it so far seems really well done. Uh, belated hug report to Mr. Certainly for helping me with some guide content that was finally published last week. Um, I had a series of lists and, uh, or a list, there's, there's multiple lists, each with, um, a con like a bit of content and an example of using that content. Uh, and it was all very much mixed up and not very well formatted. And, um, Mr. Certainly is very good at dealing with stuff like that. So I tagged him in and he, um, reordered it all perfectly and, uh, gave me a better way to format it and so on. And so it looks much better in that guide. Uh, to Foamy Guy for uh, helping me with some code on the other guide I published last week, including some last minute guidance. Uh, to Tectric for continuing to work on the switching to PyProject.toml on the libs. To Naradoc for catching a potentially two year old bug with Sparkle in the LED animation library. Um, to Dan for helping out a friend with getting started with CircuitPython development. Uh, thanks to the folks on Discord who reported changes to how the moderation bot is working, um, and to everyone who's agreed to contribute to CircuitPython Day so far, um, and a group hug. That's what I've got. All right. Thanks, Katni. Next up is Kmatch. Hello. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Uh, my first hug goes out to all the folks that come on Show & Tell with their projects. Uh, it's really inspirational to see things, and you know, sometimes it's nerve-wracking to go on the video, but uh, thanks to Ray who who brings your things and shows what cool stuff uh, that they're doing. Uh, and second, for Lady Ada for answering questions on the live streams. So I don't know anywhere else where you could have a random question and actually get a good answer from a well-experienced engineer like that. So I appreciate that. Okay, thanks all. All right, thank you. Uh, Maker Melissa, you are next. You're muted. I know the window kept moving around. <laughs> I was trying to hit the button. Uh, so I wanted to give a hug to Scott for helping me out getting the ESP IDF working with CircuitPython so I can now compile the ESP ports again. Uh, Brent for helping figure out a good workaround for Whippersnapper, uh, which was not going onto the QtPy C3 board, and a group hug to everyone else. All right. Thank you, Melissa. And now I have a couple of uh, people to read their notes. So Mark writes group hug and Temmie makes things. Has a hug for Katni and PT for helping me get an Adafruit discount code for the Desert Pie meetup and a group hug. And then we go to Scott. Hello. Um, a hug report to Katni for me for taking the lead on organizing CircuitPython Day. And also Jeff and Offer, if you want me to read status updates, I'd be happy to do that. All right. Um, I, if, if your voice is. 
Yeah, no, it's Good fine. Job. I'm just uh, yeah, yeah. hamming it up a little bit. Everything well, feel free, to, feel free to hand it off to me if you like. <laughs> I, know, I, I know it can get tiring. I've, I've been there. All right. And to round out the section, I am going to read notes from Tectric, who has a hug for Katni for continuing to help with work on moving toward pryproject.com. Dot Tommel, a hug for Nerdoc and Foamy Guy for helping to point out and fix the Adafruit logging quickly, and a group hug. And that leads us to the next section of status updates. Uh, it's really important that we know what each other is up to, and so during this section, we invite you to let us know what you've been up to since the last time we had a chance to meet together, and what you hope to be up to in the near future. If you're consistently with us, then that means one week. If you don't make it as often, then please feel free to uh, fill us in on a little more. And if you want to give us a little glimpse into your wider life, that is totally cool. And we'd love to hear about how, for instance, your uh, kitchen remodel project is just out of control and you've got a plan to fix it with CircuitPython or whatever that might be. Anyway, so I'm still getting back up to speed a little bit. But uh, last week I played with QMK because of how the support for RP2040 is merged into, the, into their development branch and we'd like to do some guides around that. And I kind of have an outline of a guide in progress. I know what hardware I want to show it working on um, and I just need to flesh that out, get photos and test it more and all that good stuff. Um, as mentioned several times, we went through the list of issues for version eight we moved some to long term, we assigned others among us, and of course we'd love your help with the 8.0 issues list, and whether that's by actually fixing or implementing the things on that list, or just providing information and testing as we go, um, everything that you do is helpful. Uh, the other thing I did was I updated Microlab. The, we go long enough between updates that there's always something interesting, a compatibility problem to solve, or new features that have a wrinkle in CircuitPython, um, but I think that that uh, pull request is ready to go in, and if it does, CircuitPython 8 will ship with Microlab version 5. So this week, um, I am starting on the ESP32 CircuitPython port. Dan uh, created a draft pull request, but there's a fairly serious memory corruption bug, which means it's not really usable. Um, in any case, we will probably merge that PR because we don't believe it's disturbing other things, other ports, um, and that kind of lowers the barrier to someone with a debugger or with an idea who wants to try it, um, although I'm going to take a couple of days to try and crack that um, first. And then uh, besides working on this QMK guide, I will work on other version 8 items that we identified last week. and. Um, Sometime in the future, somebody, maybe me, is going to look at whether we can bring the Wi-Fi support of the PiCal in, but that is definitely not something that's happening in the next week, so I probably shouldn't mention it. And next up, from Ask Patrick, uh, reports the Wemos C3 board defini definition is completed, the CircuitPython.org board page is created, and the Wemos docs have been updated with links to CircuitPython. Cool. Dan writes uh, that he's been working on the plain ESP32 port. The REPL works, but there is a crash when Thani passes code to the raw REPL. It might be a GC problem. And pass the baton to me for debugging this. Also did some refactoring and some settings automation for all expressive ports in the process of adding ESP32. Next after that, I have notes from David, who uh, excuse me, uh, is trying the absolute newest on all S2 and S3 boards to start playing with the web workflow. And he also upgraded his Game Builder Garage texture tool to auto-detect and work automatically on five different boards. The Clue, the Wii Terminal, the S3 with the TFT Feather, the Pi Gamer, and the Espressive S3 USB OTG. And there is a link in the notes doc to a GitHub repo. Future plans to test and document the web workflow for adding a texture in Game Builder Garage. This should be possible by using the web workflow in the web server with the upload function. 22 will be, for him, the year of the Linux laptop. 
David writes, I moved from Windows on a T440p to Ubuntu on a T540p, so my circuit Python workflow is a bit disturbed, but I have the same U, browser, circup, and Git, so it's just a bit different. Dual booting never really worked for daily use of free software, but having two separate laptops and forcing myself to use the Linux one is the solution. Next, notes from Foamy Guy. Foamy Guy says, house is getting new siding, lots of banging and power tool noise for a few days. Still working on final touches for the Octopus game and getting the structure of the guide laid out. Took apart an old project to get at the SD card slot on the 3.5 inch TFT Featherwing to test a new bitmap saver example for it. Following up on open PRs, and finally, working on adding relevant links for the built-in modules in the core CircuitPython docs pages. And next up is Katni. Hello. Hey. Last week, finished up the GitHub Actions Status Tower Light Guide and put that into moderation. Um, I did not note, but the GitHub Actions Status Light Guide and the um, GitHub Excellent GitHub Profile Guide were both published last week as well. Um, I updated, tested a new feature in Learn, found some bugs, passed those on, uh, started Circuit Python Day planning, and started helping Brent out with Whippersnapper guide templates for board guides. This week, continue working on Whippersnapper guide templates, test for a bug in the Sparkle LED animation. Um, I need to check into our Dino bot moderation that we use on Discord to figure out what changed with flagged keywords. Um, and then once available in the shop, I will be getting uh, the STEMI QT quad segment displays and then do a scrolling countdown timer project with those. And that's, um, oh, I, the other thing is uh, I'll be off Thursday and Friday for the next few weeks. We're building a room into our basement, um, which should be, should be interesting, uh, but it's well needed and I'm glad we're getting it done. So that's the other personal side of things, I guess. That's all I've got. All right. And next up is Kmatch. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so this past week, I created a feature request on GitHub, uh, an issue that requests an interrupt-driven event queue for capturing I squared C events. Uh, this is all towards the objective of uh, reducing the number of processor cycles used polling for touchscreen events so that I can spend most processor time on the actual animation part. So if anyone has inputs, on and I particularly learn on uh, taking other modules, seeing how they work, and then basically hacking those into something else. If you have any other existing modules that might head in that direction, uh, one of which is Keypad IO, which does have an event queue in it. But if there's others, particularly re related to scheduling, like I2C queries or something like that, I would appreciate it. And there's a issue is noted uh, in the document uh, this week. I had a request for solving some proximity sensor problem, uh, and I want to study if ultra wideband might be a solution to do that. Um, then the last thing is just back to real work, catching up on the backlog while I was out for a little while. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. And next is Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, so last week I caught up on emails and messages from being off a few weeks before that. And then I looked into an issue where the ESP web flasher was having issues flashing the C3 chip uh, at addresses other than zero. Or actually, it was when it did multiple files at addresses other than that. Uh, I updated the GitHub Actions for Whippersnapper to add a separate workflow to C3 to produce a combined binary file. And that got tested today, and it works good. Uh, I updated my CircuitPython installation so I can now compile for the ESP boards. I took over the ESP box light board that Scott had started and uh, made some, uh, and I uh, tweaked the display and it parameters to work and got that submitted. I started looking at web workflow, what would need to be changed in code.circuitpython.org to make use of it. And I ended up getting the web workflow working, but didn't end up getting further than that. Uh, this week I'm going to finish up merging in ESP box light, um, add that to circuitpython.org, and then uh, look at the web workflow and some more and get that uh, now that I have it working. And 
uh, possibly work on a new project guide using the ESP box. Hopefully it'll be a quick one. And that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> and next up, uh, Mark, butt in real quick if you want to read your notes. But otherwise, real life has been keeping me from doing a lot lately. I'm still around on Discord if anyone ever has a question in regards to anything I have written. But I did find time to make googly eyes. There's always time for googly eyes. That was another good one on Show and Tell last week. So thanks for that, Mark. And then I have notes from Tammy Makes Things, who writes, Last week, prepared for and gave a CircuitPython demo at the Desert Pie Meetup in Phoenix. Had 15 attendees, and I gave away three Circuit Playground Express devices, with the giveaway winners chosen by random.randint run from the REPL of a Pie Badge. All of the feedback was very positive. I tried to stream slash record the presentation, but was unable to do so for technological reasons. Made a decision that, at least for now, my Twitch streams will need to be on an ad hoc basis rather than on a regular schedule because my workload of my day job is very high right now. And this week, hoping to load a latest build of CircuitPython, which fixes the async IO issue I ran into on my matrix portal and finish my Team City CICD status board project. Hoping to stream at least once and do some more work on my card deck library. And last, was playing around this weekend with an implementation of Conway's Game of Life for someone else, and I'm thinking about taking my implementation and wrapping a Matrix Portal UI around it. Next up is Tanut. Hello again, Scott. Hello. Um, okay, so I'm getting close on this WebSocket serial thing. So this is the ability to do the serial connection from a web browser. Um, I got the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript working well enough on mobile that it's not terrible, um, just at least on my phone. Um, <laughs> zooming to input boxes threw me for a loop, so yeah, HTML. Um, not my strong suit, but I'm pretty happy with that as of Friday. So I need to clean up uh, this WebSocket stuff and make a PR. I think it's ready for a PR. I'll have to take a look and see if there's anything else, but I think that's pretty much... If for WebSockets, um, I'll look today. Um, my next step will be polishing up the work, web workflow. Uh, more and more people have been uh, testing it, which has been awesome. Um, so there are some issues that I'm going to have to take a look at and uh, make it work better. Um, two things in particular, uh, making it work better, including uh, checking the responsiveness. Like there's a retired wizard came up with this fix to basically prevent ticks from being disabled. Um, I think we do want to disable ticks, but I think we want to like poke poke the circuit Python task uh, when sockets have stuff available. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's happening right now, so that's that's part of the fixing I need to do. And then I also need to uh, get more comfortable with Mew and um, Barshell and Thani, uh, so that I can make sure that the the set title stuff uh, doesn't break them. Um, and I'm also out next week for vacation. This week there's a lot of stuff going on, so I may not be here when you ping me, but I'll try to get back within a few hours, um, assuming it's not right before the end of the day, because I am also trying not to work late into the night. Um, that's it for me. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. And last up for this section is Tectric, who is text only. Last week, additional prep work for getting libraries to use pyproject.toml. Most of the work is done, just going to give the few test libraries that I am using it time in the field before any next steps. Submitted a PR to update the README for the Actions CI repo. Reviewed type annotations PRs, which is always fun. Updated CPython compatibility issues for Adafruit logging. Fixed up documentation in infrastructure for a couple of new libraries. Tried to figure out if the Blue Fruit Connect phone app is able to send a large amount of data, but I think my Bluetooth sniffer was thwarted by the sheer amount of VLA traffic in my apartment complex. Next week, Tectric writes, continue to add and update documentation in the core and continue working on Bluefruit Connect image transfer feature edition. And that rounds up status updates. And the next section is in the weeds. Looks like we've got uh, three topics here. So I will take them in the order they are in the document. So Tectric writes, 
If the plan is to move from secrets.py to .env files, should we consider changing the suggested virtual environment name in library readme's away from .env? Apparently we suggest the command line python-mvenv.env. Not sure if it might confuse users to be told to edit .env if they also have a .env folder. Comments? Uh, yeah, um, that's confusing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it, it can be named whatever, that's the, the, the Python virtual environment. So I think it would make a lot of sense to change that um, because the, the name is arbitrary when it comes down to it if you're making a virtual environment to load a library. Um, are there are there some tools that automatically detect and move into virtual environments though? Excuse me. Um, know, know what their defaults are. <laughs> oh, there you go. Paul says PyCharm and VS Code will detect both .env and .venv. So well, I, could we do, do could we do venv then? Yeah. Because env is now the thing you're doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So let's switch it up to, to VENV then. Um, should be enough of a change to keep it from being confusing and not enough of a change to Borg IDEs. Yeah, and I, I would like to point out that virtual environments shouldn't be used on CircuitPy drives, but this you, is should a... be able, you should be able to do the reverse of use a .env file in regular Python. This is when installing from pip. So this, this isn't telling you to do that onto a circuit pie drive. Yeah. It's a good point though. That it should be less confusing. Okay, so the suggestion would be to use .venv because it's supported by PyCharm and VS Code? Yes. And Katni's putting that in the docs or in the in the notes document. Thank you. And Tectric's offering to do it. Alright. Thank you, Tectric. Mm-hmm. If that's all we've got on that subject, going once, going twice, then uh, Foamy Guy, you are up. All right, I'll try to sneak it in quick here, but if okay. I disappear, um, then I'll switch back to text. But uh, basically my question was around uh, if we want to have guide pages uh, or guides somewhere that cover display IO adjacent concepts like vector IO and bitmap tools um, are the, the specific two that I had in mind. Um, and then if we do want to have a guide that covers those, uh, would it make sense to be a new guide or to be new pages, perhaps within the uh, display IO guide? Uh, and it looks like so I did see. Definitely. Um, my question is, how do you do you have to use display IO to use the other two? Um, you do have to use display IO to use vector IO. Um, I suppose you could use bitmap tools to just manipulate a bitmap in memory uh, and more than save it back to the file system. But I would guess the overwhelming majority of people who are using it are going to be using it in conjunction with Display.io, but I don't think it's New like pages a in the main Display.io guide. OK. Sounds good. Yep. That's my awesome. thought. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Nice clear cut answer from Katni. Thank you, both of you. And Katni, you are. So I just wanted to highlight real quick Circuit Python Day, um, which is Friday, uh, August 19th, 2022. And let you know if you want to participate or contribute, please email circuitpythonday at adafruit.com with any questions, suggestions, or ideas. We're looking still, like, we're very much in the early stages right now. So we're looking for all kinds of things, um, whether you have any ideas for events or um, how you would want to contribute if you could, uh, just let us know and um, we'll see what we can work out. That was all I got. And uh, it is a virtual event, so I think what we're concentrating on is basically streaming, some blog stuff maybe, but uh, streaming is kind of the number one thing that we're trying to do, right? Um, yeah, and but... I had one idea, and this, like I said, this is up in the air, don't hold me to it, um, was a possible stream where folks could contribute videos, like short, you know, short one, two minute videos of their projects. Oh yeah, that sounds cool. And then, so if they can't make the stream, because there's a lot of folks who can't make show and tell, 
you know, and, and wish they could do that. So I thought if we could put together like a half hour's worth of, um, worth of video clips, we could actually just do a, a, one of the streams during the day be um, just highlighting video clips of, of, of folks' stuff that they send in. So yeah. that's, that's an idea. Doesn't StreamYard have something to facilitate doing that? I have no idea. I was a little worried Phil would have to do it because I know the Ask an Engineer setup can do it. Yeah, I think something was added to StreamYard. We should take a look at that, or somebody okay. should, but I'd be happy to take a look at it with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, sounds good. Uh, that That's one of, the, one of the ideas that I had. I thought that we could do a special edition show and tell, um, like so an actual live stream of folks um, that would be ideally, you know, CircuitPython related. Um, we obviously can't. Uh, we're not going to gate check folks, um, but something like that. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, the other thing was, was possibly a mini sprint. If we can find enough folks who would be willing to facilitate that, um, it would be virtual. So I don't know how many, you know, how, how much we'd have participation, but, um, it might still be cool to have a couple hours set aside to, uh, um, you know, help, help new folks, uh, contribute to CircuitPython if they were interested in that. Cause we have, we've never done that before. Um, but anyway, those are the ideas I've got right now. But if you have any other suggestions, you being the proverbial you, um, please send them in because we're, we're in early stages of, of getting ideas, but, um, you may certainly have more ideas than we do. So, and it's only about a month from now, so don't hold back. Yes. Don't wait. Yes. Yes. Please, please do. All right. Well, thank you, Katni. Thank you everybody who's participated today and everybody who's listened in, I think we are ready to wrap up the meeting. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for July 11th, 2022. And our next meeting will be at the usual time on Monday, July 18th, uh, usual hour of the day. And we look forward to seeing you there. Let's see, what else am I supposed to say at the end? Uh, the meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord. We invite you to join us anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We've got uh, going on 35,000 people, and we just all help each other 24-7, as I said. Uh, to be notified about changes to the time or day of the, uh, this meeting, you can subscribe to the calendar, and you can also ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. And yeah, video of this meeting will be released on YouTube and then later re-released in audio form as a podcast. So check us out on your favorite streaming service. And that wraps it up. We hope to see you all next week. And thanks again to everybody. Thanks, everyone.